For the sake of discretion, I cannot reveal where exactly the events I am describing took place. You may well guess at some point based on my descriptions, but for the sake of my own safety, I cannot say outright where this occurred. I am a doctor, which may mean quite a different thing in this part of the world than it means in yours. I have a medical license, but I am affiliated with no clinic or hospital. My patients come to my small apartment, and here I can treat light ailments, perform mundane procedures, and prescribe medications. I have delivered children in my kitchen, as well as performed vasectomies, and on at least one occasion, removed a lethally inflamed appendix. It is not as a high a paying occupation as it may be in other parts of the world, but I did not choose to become a physician for the sake of monetary gain. I am a ridiculous and hopeless idealist, as well I must be, to allow strangers into my life and home on a daily basis for the sake of my career. The winters are long and cold. I became very busy in the winter, and I have a reputation for negotiating payment. Much to my chagrin, numerous vagrants have begun visiting my premises at all hours. Their payment may be anything from a bottle of vodka to any number of items which may or may not have been acquired in an illicit manner. Most often these people require antibiotics, resetting of broken bones, or the stitching of minor wounds. There have been times as I sat calculating my supply bills that I have longed to have the will to turn them away. However, as it stands, I have very few personal expenses, and now have a standing relationship with a nearby pawn shop where I sell most of the items brought to me by my more unfortunate patients. One night, as I was carefully applying stitches to an open gash on the leg of a homeless man I knew only as his vetman, I asked him where he had acquired the lovely wall clock which he had brought to me as payment. Can you keep a secret, doctor? His voice was low and conspiratorial beneath his mass of long gray whiskers. That all depends. Will this secret bring the police knocking at my door? I answered half seriously as I added two more dashes of vodka to our glasses. Most possibly, but not for the reason you may suspect. Zvetman's manner of speaking was quite affluent, and I wondered at what life he had led before being lost to the cold, dark alleys of the city. You must understand that I and the others are not thieves, as you may have thought. But indeed, it is regrettable how we have collected these things. Zvetman then informed me that he and the group of regulars that visited my apartment had taken up residence in the village a local term used in reference to the abandoned industrial town located many miles north of the city. Originally constructed a number of decades ago by a now defunct coal mining corporation, it sat as an abandoned reminder of a time when workers signed over their lives in order to make only enough wages to barely feed themselves at stores owned by the same companies to whom they were employed. Workers were expected to live on company property and homes provided by the corporation until the end of their contract. Unfortunately, most workers did not survive in full term of what were often 20-year agreements. Upon the subsequent deterioration of the coal deposits, productivity in the area of the town had been abandoned and the homes therein left to be claimed by the forest. However, it seemed that Zvetman and his comrades had found their way through the barbed wire fences and made use of the ruined shelter as sanctuary from the harsh of the winter months. Since security had long been neglected and the police too comfortable in the warmth of the city to patrol the forest, Zvetman and the twelve others had taken up residence. The items brought to me as payment were relics left by the previous occupants, many of whom had been forcibly evicted at the project's closure. We are as grave robbers, Svetman said, smiling sadly, but these things bring us nightly bread and soup. Will you still accept these items now that you know of their origin? I carefully nodded the last stitch and looked up into his sad, remorseful eyes. 
After removing my gloves, I reached over to the tin of tobacco and began to roll a cigarette, which I handed to him before assembling another for myself. These people will never return for their property. I struck a match and lit both of our needle thin poor man smokes. You have need of it, and I must at least have money to buy the things which I used to treat you. I am not the doctor who has the luxury of great ethical standards. I wish only to make those ill better without being forced onto the street as well. So I will forget what you have told me. Svetman nodded stoically as he began to bandage the wound himself with practiced ease. But tell me, comrade, I asked, how did a man like you come to such a position? He stared down at the red ember of his cigarette thoughtfully before replying. I died. My eyes widened as his sad smile returned once more. I was a laborer working construction in this very city. I was in the midst of a day's work when one day, when I was 41, I had a massive heart attack. I was rushed to the hospital where my heart ceased to beat for two minutes before I was revived in the emergency room. After that day, I changed my lifestyle. I began to take care of myself, and I took a steady regimen of medications to control my blood pressure and cholesterol. I had a brother, my twin, a year after my coronary, he fell from five stories up at the construction site where he had worked and died instantly. I felt the crushing fall as if it had happened to me. That very moment, I knew what had occurred. I asked myself over and over again through the following months, why had I come back? You see, I knew the truth of the matter. I had traded his life for mine. He had a wife and a family doctor. He had four children who loved him dearly. And yet I had returned to my lonely daily routine so that he might pass in my place. I stared aghast at his words. Surely you could not have believed such a thing. Oh, but I did. And I still do. I nearly died on the 13th of April, and my brother fell on that exact date a year later. The guilt was like a growing cancer in my soul. I began drinking, and when that was not enough to numb the wretched ache of my crime, I began injecting morphine. I had gone into the darkness and fled whatever peace had been offered to me only so that my dear twin brother could take my place. I stood at his funeral and looked upon his corpse knowing that it should have been mine in that coffin. And this, this idea drove you to your current state. I was horrified by what Svetman had revealed. If this were true, then any person revived from death would in turn cause the demise of another. What if it does? Who would notice, Doctor? Who could watch and see the trade as it were made over the course of years? But I know now it was a deal. I was offered life for a price, and I agreed to pay it. It was so easy to ignore the intuitive truth, which to me was revealed dream by dream and memory by agonizing memory. In time, it was my excessive guilt which forced me to accept the horror of my crime. I sat in silence as the bare nub of my cigarette burned down to my fingers. But you have no actual memory of what transpired while you were lifeless? Sometimes in the deepest oblivion of my slumber I feel that I glimpse that event momentarily. And to whom was this bargain made? God? I fear not, Doctor. I sense a very dark and discernible presence that is far from holy lingering at the gate of death's door. This thing, this Hades, this Anubis, waits and tempts those weak enough to fear what lies beyond the first outer darkness of our demise. I have spent these last few years in contemplation of this thing so that I might never be tempted to flee from eternity again. At one time, I thought of taking my own life, but as my consciousness drew closer to that closing moment, I sensed that indeed, this may lead to an even greater imbalance. So, 
You live in the cold, waiting to die. Yes, me and the other twelve. Or at least so it was in the beginning. Now wait, Svetman. You mean to say that all of you living there in the village have come to believe this bleak concept? Even as I spoke, my mind had raced ahead and placed the pieces of this dark puzzle into place. This was no mere collection of downtrodden homeless. This was a group more akin to a religious commune living like the awakened dead in a place as appropriate as the ghost town. All of us have died, Doctor, and all of us were resuscitated only to lose a loved one one year later in the future. How, how did you find each other? We found each other as if magnetically drawn, and once we had shared in our knowledge, we were led to the village. It was there we found it waiting. It, you mean the entity of which you spoke? Yes, and in Zvetman's eyes, I now saw a feverish glare as he poured the vodka down his throat and looked upon me in a fury of his confession. It was there in the blackness of that mine, there. It had found the means to cross over in some vague form of presence. What could it possibly want, Svetman? He leaned forward over the table and pressed his face into his chapped and leathery hands. We believe it is to be assured that when our time comes to pass again, we will be barred again from entry into the next phase of afterlife. It could mean that our bargain is binding, and even now we will never know peace. Think, comrade. Remember the ailments and the treatments you have administered? We have become desperate to stay alive for our fear. Our instinct declares that we should once more transgress into this fiend's realm. It will initiate an even greater curse. We have gathered in that empty, cold town to die, only to realize as we crept into starvation and sickness that perhaps our trade was as not as of yet complete. And what brought this revelation? I had now refilled my glass to the very top and forced myself to drink the cup empty before listening for Svetman's answer. As we lay malnourished and sick with infections and disease, we saw it moving through the streets at night when the snow fell heaviest. We sensed it waiting outside the walls, listening at the frosted windows and crawling over the snow-laden rooftops. In the morning, we could see its trail leading from house to house and then back to the mouth of the mine shaft. Never could we behold it, but always we knew it was there. That was when we sought you out, Doctor. We heard rumors of a physician who could give treatment and trade for items of value. Just as we traded in death, now we trade in life. And as the thing stands as our tormentor, you have become our savior. He studied my face solemnly for many long minutes before speaking again. You do not believe me, do you? It is not for me to believe or disbelieve. What difference would it make to you? Should I give you a number for a therapist? You are an intelligent man, Svetman, and if you have chosen to accept this dismal reality as true, then there is little I can do to change your mind. Do I think that you and your fellows would be better off forsaking this course and pursuing life once more? I'm a doctor, of course. I would choose to see you living a real life. All of you share a suffering, and this has united you. This survivor's guilt has made you all miserable. I would suggest you all come back to the city and stay in a shelter. I know of three churches who would take you into the care for a time. At least there would be warmth, Svetman. Svetman was already limping towards the door when I took his arm. Please consider what I am saying. As a friend, I was nearly pleading with him as he gazed back with sad, forlorn eyes. I can find a truck, and we will drive out there tonight and collect the others. Your concern is most honorable, 
but do not trouble yourself over our miserable fate. He gently took my hand away from his arm and patted me on the shoulder as he opened the door. He glanced over his shoulder briefly as he smiled. Enjoy the rest of the vodka. You will need it more than I where you are going. Do not worry. I have some of my own. I heard the door close behind me and I sighed as I thought of the desolate destination which lay waiting for him miles away in a frozen wilderness. The following morning as I fried bacon on my small gas stove, I listened to the morning radio as I sipped coffee and watched the snow fall through the window over the sink of my apartment's kitchen. I heard the weather forecast and felt my heart plummet into the pit of my stomach as I heard the announcer explain that a blizzard was amassing cold power in our region. Later in the morning, I had made my way to a nearby grocer to stock up on supplies. And as I walked down the sidewalk through the maze of solemn gray buildings, I watched the snow falling in ever-increasing density with growing apprehension. How well supplied were Svetman's 13? I wondered how long they could hold out if stranded on their island in a sea of raging winds and furious snow. In my apartment, I studied the most recent items left with me by the 13. Here were vintage comic books, the fine wall clock, an expensive camera, all items harvested from the empty remains of the mining village. I imagined them now, huddled together around some fireplace, stuffing their clothes with pages torn from found paperbacks to further insulate them from the biting, deadly cold. How long could they last? There would be plenty of wood to burn, but the food, yes, starvation would be the enemy. In time, their bodies would stiffen with the atrophy of prolonged hunger. Who would gather the wood? Who would break apart the dining room chairs and writing desks to keep the fires going? First there would be hunger, and then there would be cold. The cold would fall over them like deadly arctic blanket. Once the cold was in their lungs, and their blood slowly cooling within their flesh, death would come quickly. Even as it occurred to me to call the authorities and give away the presence of my miserable, doomed patients at the village, I heard the radio announcer decree that all rolled crews were immobilized. The roads would not be cleared. There would be no way to get to the 13. I waited and prayed that they had supplies. I saw the rifle brought to me by Redvik in return for having a rotted tooth pulled from his jaw. I wondered if they had another with bullets as well. Would someone lift the weapon to their shoulder and end the misery of his fellows? Would Svetman take pity on his comrades and free them from the next inevitable stages in their nightmare, horrid frostbite, or perhaps their body's betrayal as their hunger turned self-consuming to devour muscle tissue? Or would they still cling to their belief that death would no longer release them? I poured more kerosene into my eater and leaned back onto the couch to read the old comic tales of two fisted glory brought to me from the village. I imagined the child of some long dead miner reading it by lamplight. This American publication would have been almost impossible to come by, and whoever's parents would have had to have gone to ridiculous lengths to attain it. I drank, smoked, and waited for the first break in the storm. I now knew I must get to them as soon as possible. For two weeks, the storm raged intermittently and the entire region was buried in a foot after foot of falling snow and layers of sharp crystalline ice. On the very morning when I saw the first plows struggling down the roads, I called my friend and borrowed his truck, which was an old military troop conveyor large enough to contain 13 frozen homeless should it be required. As I bounced down the rough and craggy road through dense woods and massive drifts, I contemplated what sight should await me with terror. The trip was slow and dangerous as the wheels spun on packed snow and ice sheets. Countless times I nearly lost control of the vehicle 
which I had little experience handling under the best of conditions. Finally, after what seemed an endless day, I approached the gate and wire-barbed fence of the village city limits. The ruined sign by the road read Rovna, population 1,356, except that the 56 had been scratched away, leaving the sign to now declare Rovna, population 13. I found the chain which held the gate to be only held by an unset padlock which dangled an ineffectual ornament from the still icy silver of the relatively new chain. I shoved the gate open but instantly knew that the snow would prohibit any further expanse of the opening. I left the truck running and walked through a narrow valley in the snowdrifts towards the rooftops which I saw emerging from the red dusk lit snow in which every building had been submerged. The wind was pressing down over me with a crushing dismal pressure as I made my way into what had once been the town square. For a moment I stopped and gazed directly upon a massive granite statue of what could only have been the respective founder of the bankrupt mining company. Such idolatry had been common in the days before the union representatives arrived, shouting in long hurried rants about the rights of downtrodden laborers. The empty gray eyes of the statue stared down with desperate, shrewd scrutiny. It was only after meeting the unnerving idol's menace that I noticed the black smoke rising in the distance. Quickly, wading onward through the waist-high drifts, I saw the chimney on a particularly large rooftop spouting a long, twisting cloud of gray smoke which had summoned the visualization of some poor unfortunates gathered within their snowy retreat huddled and freezing. My legs pumped on through the knee-deep powder. The muscles of my thighs and stomach burned with fatigue as I saw mounds of snow shoveled aside from the doorway of the building. It, like most of the structures, was a single-story concrete box, but much larger than the other barracks' residential housing units. I studied the plaque on the wall and recognized it as the community center slash daycare slash funeral home slash church built for the workers. Of course, the 13 would have chosen it for its larger space and massive fireplace. Here they could remain together and ride out the storm as a group. Now breathless, I fell to the door, clouds of hot steam puffing from my aching lungs, and began beating on the frozen surface with my cold, numbed fist. I heard the ice around the frame of the wooden steel reinforced door cracking as it began to open and beheld Svetman standing calmly with arms outstretched in the entrance. Doctor, he proclaimed as he wrapped his arms around me in a welcoming embrace. My God, you are frozen. He pulled me within and I was immediately greeted by the aromas of burning pine and cooking food as my eyes adjusted to the low light from the blinding whiteness of the snow outside. He shut the door and immediately I was struck by the intense warmth which set my wind-blown skin tingling at every nerve ending. I could see chairs gathered in a semicircle around the great fireplace where there were at least half of a dozen people of various ages seated warming themselves by the roaring blaze. Others sat at small candlelit tables indulging in activities ranging from card games to chess with bottles of wine and vodka at hand as they drank from small jars and styrofoam cups. My eyes locked on the fire itself. A clever spit had been crafted over the flames, on which roasted an expertly cleaned and tied young deer. Several small iron fold-out camp grills had been erected by the fire as well, on which sat steaming pots of soup, beans, noodles, and dumplings. I was immediately taken aback by the impression that I had just interrupted a church supper or holiday gathering. Svetman smiled at my stunned expression and slapped me on the shoulder. Doctor, you look as if you have seen a ghost. Come warm yourself. I, I don't understand. I, I feared you all had... I stammered as he led me to a chair, and a large-boned woman with dark eyes who I knew as Yana poured me tea into a tin cup and placed it gently in my shaking hands. What? Perished in the blizzard? Oh no, my friend. We fared quite well, as you can see. He sat down beside me and took a small pipe from where it had sat on the bricks beside the fire. 
Taking a long stick, he placed its tip in the fire and then used the small flame to light the sweet Cavendish tobacco. I'm sorry, I, I had no idea you were so well provisioned. My face burned with embarrassment as he puffed away at the well-worn antique appearing smoke utensil and leaned forward to squeeze my shoulder reassuringly. It's quite okay, my friend. I am sorry that you have risked your own safety on our behalf. You are a very kind spirit to have gone to such trouble out of concern for us. A man such as you is a great rarity these days. How did you make the trip? I borrowed a truck from a friend in the city, I replied awkwardly. I admit that I came back to take you all with me. Svetman laughed and slapped his thigh. Good lord, you are a saint. Does your generosity and kindness know no bounds? The others were listening quietly to our conversation as they occasionally whispered and nodded to each other, which what seemed approval. I feel a fool, Svetman. I took a deep drink from the tea and found it bitter with a hint of ginger and cinnamon. I came here expecting to find a tragedy, and now I feel as if I have interrupted a pleasant get-together. No, no, by all means, do not feel foolish. We were bored to tears with each other and are glad to have a gift. The warmth of the tea was spreading through my veins and soon the very tips of my fingers and toes were tingling with a not so unpleasant sting. My relief combined with the powerful immediate warming of my beverage turned a switch in my brain from fear and concern into glee which bordered euphoria. I'm just so happy you are all okay. I said, gripping Svetman's rough hand with utter gratitude. My eyes were brimming with tears of joy now that my anxiety was abated. I have worried for weeks now that you all lay starving out here and are roasting, you are roasting venison and playing cards. I broke into laughter and wiped my damp cheek with the sleeve of my parka as the others joined in in chuckles and joking murmurs. Well, my friend. We must do something to pass the time. We wait. Wait, you said. Said someone as I took another step of the delicious day. Wait for the storm to break? No, my dear doctor. Svetlana answered through the smoke curling and languid of the wind clouds around his long, gray black hair. Waiting for you. And in a moment, all seemed to have grown silent. The others were now a silent, attentive eye. Savintha, Jacob, and Redvid, Mikhail, Arvenia, Kreda, Mikieth, Nishta, Karmel, Grivna, and Gustav, all faces that I knew so well gazing at me with wonder and a certain expectancy. What? My merriment had ceased as I drained the remainder of my cup and looked around, the room drifting slightly as the Alcohol lightened the scene into a moving, slow image. How are you feeling, doctor? Svetman said, with a now serious, almost intimidating expression on the warm features beneath his shaggy beard and long hair. Are you warm? Yes, that tea has quite livened my blood, I answered as my shoulders slumped heavy and wearied. Svetman smiled oddly as he made a bizarre gesture with his left hand and touched my forehead as he spoke words which sounded like Dara Kudra Bekanothvasribodin. Immediately I fell back into the chair and almost slid out onto the floor. Two of the others swept forward and took me by the arms as they carried me across the room where a large oaken dining table waited bare by the fire. Any attempt I made at this point to support my own weight was futile, as they laid me down and began removing my clothing with perfunctory attention, as if this were a mere ritual that had been repeated many times. Words lay still and unspoken in my mouth, as all control over my body had been decommissioned. They were gathering around now and staring down at my naked body with the strangest reflective depth, a repeated mask on each of their faces. I believe I have a duty 
To inform you of what is transpiring here, my friend, the Zetman said, leaning over into his elbows and speaking directly into my ear as he held the pipe by the bowl and gestured with the mouthpiece at those standing. I cannot say why fate should allow a man such as yourself to fall into such a bitter and wretched end as this. His tone was one of philosophical quandary and reflexive concern. I am certain you are wholly undeserving of what has befallen you. It seems to me that you have most likely done harm to no one or nothing during the entire extent of your existence on this planet. It is a terrible truth that it is the concerns of your heart which has made you the object of our deception. I have lied to you, my friend. Look into the faces of those standing around you and know that my tale was true. Each of these thirteen people has tasted the darkness of the grave and each was offered a trade in turn. However, it is the conditions of this barter which I have withheld from you. This dark entity with who met with each of us at the portal of demise gave very specific terms as to what was required. This spirit is a very old and vile being, and it is through these bargains that it remains an influence here in our reality. When each of us returned, we brought back a piece of its essence in our hearts, and it is this cold blemish in our soul which makes terrible, horrible demand in turn for its gift of continued conscious life. We are much older than we appear, my friend, and it was within the tunnels of that very mine out there buried in the snow where we all met death many years ago. We were but thirteen miners trapped in the darkness of the underground. When they finally dug us from the collapse of this would-be tomb, they marveled at our survival. If only they knew the axe which we would go forth to commit to pay for this miracle. If it were known, I am sure our fellows would have left us buried. My dearest twin brother did not fall, as I told you, doctor. We lured him to a secluded house and let him drink of the same tonic which was given to you. Then after the words given to us by the old cannibal spirit were uttered, we laid him out as we have you and ate of his flesh as he still lived. You see, it is the life in the flesh which gives vitality, and the flesh must live as it is eaten. I think it is merely the bitter nature of the spirit which requires the sacrifice to be of one who truly cares for those in its contract, perhaps as evidence of the bargainer's greed, each of us forced to find and choose one who has true caring for us so that we may betray and devour them. Brothers, sisters, lovers, friends, parents, children, caretakers, and healers, all tricked, drugged, and feasted on, so that we may continue our empty, meaningless lives. We had traveled this world as outsiders in exile for decades before returning here to Rovna, where all our misery had begun. And here it was that we found you, as if delivered by the cruelest joke of some ancient pagan god, yet another compassionate soul for us to deceive and offer up in trade for a few more bleak years on this earth. On behalf of us all, my friend, 